Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Impossible. I am your co-host, Austin, and out here again in the lovely valley of Salt Lake City, Utah. Incredible view. So today, um, we're going to go off script a little bit, and have a uh, bit of a heart-to-heart, I suppose, because those of you who've been following, or those of you just simply know, I have been getting tests done this entire year uh, following my trip to Houston, Texas for the CD30 CAR T-cell clinical trial, and in hopes that that would have taken care of my first relapse. And in April, I had found a lymph node above the right clavicle, which is, again, where kind of the hot spot's been. And, and so had tests done and showed a little bit of activity, but nothing, uh, nothing that seemed out of the ordinary, but we certainly insisted upon continuing the, the testing since the node was still present. And so then at the end of June, we had tests done and it showed an SUV, the sugar uptake value, that was a bit higher than, a little bit higher than the than the liver, which is what they use as a kind of a, a, a standard or a marker when reading anything else in your body for the uh, for the PET scan or PET scan. So that all went fine, and we just needed to keep an eye on it. So we scheduled again for the uh, last week of August here, and. The test here has shown an SUV that is four times the amount from the liver and about two and a half times greater than, in terms of the lymph node itself, about two and a half times greater than what it was in June. And there is a second lymph node that has pretty much appeared uh, out of nowhere, with, also with a high SUV. So what we can deduce from this test and with such high value SUVs is that I have suffered yet another relapse. Oh. So what does this mean? Well, this means that I have to continue with treatment now for a third or fourth time, depending on how the technicalities would be organized, I suppose. And those of you who do have experience with cancer know that the more times you relapse, what this basically means is that the cancer has been able to leave a few behind and have have had the possibility, or have had the chance, the opportunity, and quite possibly could have learned from these previous lines of treatment. And you have the possibility of adaptation. You have the possibility of mutation. But most of the time you have the arisal or arrival of a more and more aggressive response from the cancer cells. So, so a few things to take away from this year in general with, with the testing is one, well, we need to be super thankful that I've been having these tests done, you know, on repeat, pretty much, uh, pretty much a, a, a decision I take it upon myself uh, to have done. Uh, it wasn't under the recommendation of, any, of anybody, but after the first relapse, I wanted to be a bit more proactive in keeping an eye on things and I'm super happy that I did because we've been able to catch this if it is if this is cancer which again we can quite safely state that it is if it is cancer we've caught it at an early point in 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 the relapse and so 
you know, that would be some good news in terms of the intensity of our response to the grow back uh, would be. Um, secondly, uh, to, to verify what it is, I do have a core needle biopsy scheduled um, for um, uh, a couple of Wednesdays from now. And so what that'll tell us is obviously what it is and if there's presence of anything else, um, if it is cancer, what type of cancer it is, has it mutated, has it not mutated? Um, the hope is that it hasn't mutated. Um, again, as I've said in the past, I've, I've drawn a pretty, pretty long straw in terms of types of cancers to fight. So I, I don't want it to turn into something even more aggressive. Um, <laughs> just a personal preference, I suppose. And, and so we'll have the biopsy done and, and we'll have the results from that in, in around a week or so, just uh, depending upon uh, length of time for, uh, for, a, for a result to come from a biopsy, my gosh. And so what does this mean going forward after the biopsy if it is a return of the cancer? We will be going into a immunotherapeutic slash chemotherapeutic, uh, chemotherapeutic regiment. Most likely will be uh, pembrolizumab and GVD. I'm, I'm not, I can't name off the, the GVD at the moment. Um, um, actually, might be able to. It's gemcitabine. Uh, Venerelbine and liposomal doxorubicin. So um, doxorubicin I have had encounters with before, but not this particular type of, of doxorubicin. Uh, what the difference is between the two, I don't know. <laughs> um, but then you have uh, venerelbine, I believe is what it is, is the drug, is in the same family as venblastine and uh, vincristine. And then the gemcitabine is just a part of the mixture. I know gemcitabine and the doxorubicin, liposomal doxorubicin, are two of the, I'm pretty sure it's those two, are the two of the th of three chemos that are known and are used within the, the, the fight against uh, classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then I, I'm fairly certain that the venerelbine is just something that they throw into their uh, together um, just in terms of data it's shown that having this having this set uh, this triple threat is uh, has a higher efficacy than just the two uh, that are, are, are well known uh, players in terms of attacking this particular type of cancer like I said before so and then the, the pembrolizumab is the immunotherapeutic drug. Um, it's a PD-1 inhibitor. So uh, basically it's, it's uh, what it's able to do, um, it as well as the other PD-1 inhibitors do is they go in and basically, so the cancer cell, and this was explained to me not too long ago, so it's, it's fresh in my mind and I'm gonna try to do it without butchering it. So uh, shout outs to, uh, our uh, fearless leader, Matt Hill. <laughs> but basically the cancer cell uh, is present. The T cells, the soldier cells of your immune system go out and they have what are the PD-1 uh, kind of attachments, arms, we could, we could uh, for uh, layman's terms, in my case, my terms as well. <laughs> um, they go and then they attach to the PD-L1 or L2 uh, arms upon uh, what needs to be killed. You know, the B cell tells the T cell to go and kill it. Well, the cancer cell, what it's able to do is when the CD, when your CD, in my case, four or eight, the T cells go and attach to the immune, uh, to the cancer cell, the cancer cell, uh, it, the, T, the T cell attaches to it. The T cell says, hey, I'm going to uh, uh, kill you. And then the cancer cell, what it's, a, what it's been able to do is it's able to send back a signal saying, no, you don't need to worry about me, move on. 
wicked stuff. And in this case here, what happens is the PD-1 inhibitor goes and somehow is able to negate that signal from the cancer cell telling the T cell to just continue on. It's able to negate that somehow. That's where uh, rabbit hole that I don't understand, <laughs> but basically it inhibits that signal or it, it stops that signal from the cancer cell telling the T cell to move on and the T cell goes in and is able to kill the, the, the cancer cells. So you have that immunotherapeutic drug with the three chemotherapeutic drugs. And that would be over two cycles. Uh, each cycle is 21 days. Um, the, the Pembro, uh, we, just to call it for now, um, the Pembro is given on day one of each of those cycles. And then the three chemos are given on days one and day eight of the three week cycle. And then we re just repeat that once, hopefully once, and then I will have a following PET scan to verify that I've gone into technic the technical uh, complete remission or complete response. Um, if I do show that I'm in complete response, that is where I'll have a uh, <laughs> fleeting <laughs> period of washout to, to, to somewhat recover from the chemo, uh, from the chemo delivery, because the, the Pembro, um, this particular uh, PD-1 uh, PD inhibitor, Pembro, is not too toxic on the body. The three chemo chemotherapeutic drugs, yes, they're, they're, they're chemos, they're, they're, they, they are toxic. So I have, a, I have a, a, a small window of a washout period. And then, and then comes the part of treatment that I inevitably could not avoid. And that is the autologous, autologous uh, stem cell transplant. This is where I, I am prepped with a bunch of uh, like uh, pulmonary function test. Uh, I'll have a like an echocardiogram and a few other tests just to verify, like just to make sure that I'm I'm good to go into uh, the the protocol or the treatment, and then I will go through a I will go through a machine that basically uh, they'll pump me up with a bunch of medicine that tells my bone marrow to produce a bunch a bunch of stem cells, kind of like an override kind of you know override switch, and then they'll hook me up to a, a machine that will. Uh, go in, come back out. Um, basically what it does is it pulls out my blood that has the extra um, amount of stem cells and then it pumps my blood back into me after, after a machine collects those stem cells. Uh, autog uh, autologous, autologous means that it's stem cells from my body. So at the moment I don't have to worry about uh, or ever have to worry about, hopefully, um, that I don't have to worry about uh, what's called uh, grafts versus host disease, um, which comes from an allogenic transplant, which means donor-based. So they'll collect my stem cells, pump the blood back into me, thankfully, <laughs> and uh, and then they will go and um, you know uh, hold on to them, uh, put them in a freezer. I don't know, um, and then. Uh, comes the the nasty part of of this uh, type of treatment. So the reason why they have to collect your stem cells is because you go through six straight days of high dose chemo. What this does is it goes in and it wipes out your entire immune system, every cell, like every lymphocyte, B cell, T cell, everything. Um, it wipes out your entire immune system, wipes out you, it wipes out your white blood cells and your 
basically all your red blood cells because the the chemo is given to a dose that shuts down your bone marrow it shuts down your bone marrow's ability to produce stem cells that turn into the your you know your fast replicating cells that turn into everything that you need you know immune cells white blood cells and so on and so forth to other things that you know but my focus are obviously those three and so you go through six days of this uh, chemotherapeutic regimen. I don't know the drugs. Um, personally, uh, between you and I, I don't know if if I'm going to even bother with uh, learning about those drugs. I don't know if I'm going to look at them. I don't know if while I'm being delivered the medication, if I'm going to even bother to ask questions about it, I most likely will uh, as I've tried to be as firm and sturdy and stoic as possible throughout this journey, I reserve those six days to um, turn a blind eye. I very much reserve the right to do that. And I, I, I most likely will. So then you have those six days, then you have a day off, which is day negative one. As the day negative eight to day negative two are the chemo days. Day negative one is a day off, yay. And then day zero is where you have the introduction, the transplant of your stem cells. And what that's supposed to do, and what it hopefully does, <laughs> is kickstarts your um, your bone marrow to start producing cells again. What happens there, how it happens, why it happens, I don't know. All I know is that they reintroduce your stem cells and then things are supposed to get better from there. Um, for this period, so for starting with the chemo to day zero and then for three weeks post, uh, three weeks post of the injection from day zero, I will be in um, quarantine. I, I will have my own uh, kind of uh, private suite uh, there in in the hospital in the cancer center, and uh, you know, no. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to have somebody in there. Uh, I'm assuming I can have at least one person. Hopefully, otherwise. Um, I might go insane, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm used to working alone, so wouldn't be too bad, but uh, I will be, it'll just be like, you know, little to no contact, probably no contact for those three weeks because I have no immune system. I, I have little to no white blood cells. So I have, my body has absolutely no ability to fight off anything, I, anything, uh, you know, it's, you know, uh, in those moments, you know, the, the common cold could kill me. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of situation. Um, obviously I'll be on medication to try to help, help along the, the production of those cells. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm sure a plethora of antibiotics, antifungal, antibacterial medication as well. Um, but so that's three weeks there in the hospital that I'll have. And then if I'm doing okay, if numbers are to a certain standard, what that is, I don't know. I don't know what those values are, but if I, if I achieve a certain standard, then I will be able to uh, leave the hospital and then continue my quarantine. Uh, the quarantine will, will certainly have to persist for one more month at minimum, uh, because then one month post hospital leave, I will be required to <laughs> to receive <laughs> my childhood immunization shots, which is wild to me to think about. But again, as I stated before, this is a complete wipeout of your immune system. It's zero cells are left behind, which is you know, kind of the <laughs> the reason why we're doing this is to 
could because obviously in my case we've had fantastic responses from lines of treatment before but somehow a few cells remain from the cancer and that's all you need um, and so that includes the B cells within your with your immune system which are the memory cells so they don't have you know your your new B cells you know are are that of you know naivety they they, they don't know what to fight off because they're brand new <laughs> so I have to I'll have to get those shots done and so then starting from the end of month one into month two post hospital uh, will be you know I'm assuming a, a slow slow integration back into the public um, contact with people and stuff like that again I'll be on med I'll be on a bunch of medications to help you know to help uh, mitigate any risks in terms of you know um, any type of infections or you know so on and so forth but but ultimately it, it'll have to still be fairly separated and uh, and in reclusion so gives me plenty of time to read and listen to podcasts <laughs> I suppose and I can also record like this because obviously this you know this this setting here is is uh, intimate and I, I can be secluded for this for these recordings here and I, I probably I, I've been I've been working through a few ideas which we'll, I'll share here in a second but so yeah so then you have the end of month two post hospital leave and uh, somewhere in here I know there's going to be another PET scan whether it's recommended or not I'm definitely gonna have one <laughs> um, so yeah and then it's it's just a slow process back into excuse me what some call reality for me it's it has turned into obviously not a dream not a nightmare though it certainly hasn't been a nightmare I've had the moments you know in the midst of treatment where I've woken up and said oh you know darn I wish that was all a all occurring in a different <laughs> different realm a different reality a different dimension different universe but it's not this is this is reality as I've had to come to know so we forge on this is something this is something that's happened in the past something out of my control not of not out of the control of my immune system unfortunately it had a defect for a moment and and now I've had to deal with this external factor on on a scale that is felt to be tipped completely out of my control to the other side. And Matt had sent me uh, sent me a reel just today actually. It was of uh, a famous chef, world famous chef, I don't know if I can say his name because I'm not going to be able to quote him precisely. I didn't write it down. Don't know why I didn't. But to paraphrase was that everyone is dealt an incredibly unjustifiable and, and 
and gruesome hand. And in his opinion, the earlier that that is dealt, the, the better you are in terms of coming out from that. And the more you are able to, the more you are able to withstand and almost given the opportunity to embrace dancing within that storm, within the ring. What I've learned is that facing the storm and charging towards it can hopefully mean that I can come come out of it sooner than than what I would if I were to even just stand my ground, which is still very honorable. Stand firm. <laughs> Let it hit you. Or if I or especially if I were to just not not brace myself at all and fall into a bit of limbo. That I would see that as putting yourself in a position to experience the storm for for quite for quite some time. And I'm not I'm not willing to do that and I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I see this as an opportunity to charge towards the storm that I've had to come to face. I didn't have a choice in this. I didn't I didn't want to go through this. I don't want to go through this. But the hand I've been dealt, whether it be because of poor choices in the past or not, unfortunately, unfortunately we'll never know why this came about. But I'm happy to be dealing with it now rather than later in life because this means that and I've already had a, a wonderful uh, tasting of this, is that the individual that I've been able to become through these times is, is an Austin that I had always envisioned, but couldn't necessarily see with, with, with clear vision. With, with a clear perspective. It's always been foggy. It's always been difficult to see what I could become. No matter, how, no matter how much I had hoped and dreamed of who I could become. And and I can say that with a little bit of excitement for this, for this treatment, I on it, I obviously and honestly don't know who will be coming out on the other side. I know it'll be Austin, some version of me, and I know that I'll be stronger, but To be blunt, I've I've been fighting off this unrelenting feeling of of engaging with this sort of disconnectum with reality, with the day to day, with your daily commute, <laughs> your daily exercise, your daily eating, your everything that is reality as we know it it's it's been difficult to 
to stay engaged with that. Having already been an introvert coming into this and trying not to to fall to my knees and curl up into a ball, I do have to I do have to be honest, brutally honest with you all in that I don't know I don't know where I will be when I come out of that transplant. <sighs> Plan for the worst, hope for the best. That's certainly been keeping me going. And we plan for the worst. We 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 did plan for for this transplant to be a possibility. We hoped it wouldn't. We we had hoped that I wouldn't have to go through this and that I could could enjoy enjoy some time without having to worry about fighting for my life involuntarily. But it's turned into a very voluntary and, and willing to face these battles. I've turned into a very voluntary and willingly, or willingful, willingly. I'm, w I'm willingly <laughs> able. And, and I want. I, I'm, I'm ready to fight. There we go. Spit it out eventually. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready for this to be over. I'm ready for this to be done. We have things to accomplish. We have people to meet. We have things to do. We have lives to better. Unfortunately for the coming months, I have to, I'm forced to, to, to look in, to be a bit more introspective. To, to take a moment away from to impacting other lives, others' lives. And some, some would say that I could I can continue to battle for others, but in this time, in these coming months, I need to I need to focus on myself. And I don't regret making that decision. This is a moment where I have, I have to be selfish. Not in a narcissistic way, obviously. In a way that is... In a way that I deem to be most valuable and most useful for my time. In battling for <laughs> more time on this beautiful green planet this small pebble orbiting a insignificant star circling around a supermassive black hole in the middle of our of our dear dear milky way galaxy of our galaxy that is insignificant not unique compared to the hundreds of millions to trillions of other galaxies in our observable universe. But was, what does make it unique is that we all have the opportunity to experience all of that insignificance individually but ultimately together. And this, this experience may be dealt with a heavy, heavy hand for myself in particular and for millions and millions of others, billions of others. But I will continue to fight to not take that for granted and to do the best that I can with the time that I have here, however long that may be.
So, yeah. <laughs> There's an update for everybody. Uh, one that I had hoped. Hoped. I didn't hope. There was no hope. There was planning for something to go great, or there was planning for something to go bad. And now that something has gone, not even bad, negatively, towards my outlook of life, physically, um, it will not. It will not diminish my outlook on life, mentally. As I discussed with Matt no matter the short-term and long-term side effects that I'll be experiencing with this type of treatment. Ultimately, if I can keep my head right, if I can keep my head on my shoulders, stay steady, stay firm, I will be able to get back to, to a formidable position physically. Do not fret. <laughs> These are the best of times. So, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the view as, as I have the opportunity to do so before I have to leave and not come back for quite some time. Trying to enjoy it as I can. Uh, coming up here uh, this coming Saturday, I have a half marathon at Cedar City. So stay tuned for some content coming from that. I will be <laughs> slowly dying <laughs> as I as I race down that canyon. But at the same time, it's going to be an absolutely thrilling and incredible experience, and I, I can't wait for it. I, I'm super pumped, super excited. Trying to get acclimated to the high elevation. The starting line for the race is at 8,200 feet elevation, which is a 25% reduction in available oxygen that I'm used to from my from my lands back in Ohio. So trying to get acclimated as much as I can here in the hotel, we're at 5,000 feet. So it, I've, I've been able to do some work here, but I'm gonna head up, heading up to the mountains throughout this week to to get up to higher elevations, you know, 7,000 plus feet to just get acclimated to, uh, to the slight lack of oxygen, <laughs> but all is well. So again, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in and be on the lookout for more content as we, as we also get ready for the Columbus marathon. And, uh, we'll see how I personally can, can go after that. We'll see. So us here at A Possible Performance are striving to build a culture of strength, fostering a spirit of growth in constant pursuit of the impossible. Take care, and as always, be impossible.